want to uh, thank our, our first panelists again for their, their contribution and their, and their remarks. I think they were exceptional in giving us certainly a context uh, to the background and a background, if you will, of Ferguson and the events possible. Uh, now uh, we're going to sort of move on to our Earl F. Nelson Lecturer. Uh, the Earl F. Nelson Memorial Lecture was established <clears throat> by the trustees of the University of Missouri Law School Foundation in memory of Mr. Nelson, one of the founders of the foundation uh, and a former member of the Board of Curators of the University of Missouri. Uh, and through their generosity, we are allowed to invite uh, distinguished speakers. Um, and uh, our speaker today is another one. We add to that wonderful list that keeps growing. And so I look forward to hearing his remarks. <clears throat> Mark Maurer. Uh, began his work in criminal justice with the American Friends Service Committee in 1975 and served as the organization's National Justice Communications Coordinator. Since joining the Sentencing Project, of which he's currently the Executive Director, in 1987, he has testified before Congress and state legislatures, and he frequently appears on radio and television networks, uh, and is regularly interviewed by the New York Times, the Washington Post, and National Public Radio, uh, among other sort of major media outlets. He has served as an adjunct faculty member <clears throat> at the George Washington University and a Payne Theological Seminary, as well as a consultant to the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the National Institute of Justice, and the American Bar Association's Committee on Race and the Criminal Justice System. In 2005 is when he became the executive director of the Sentencing Project. And for those who are <coughs> criminal justice scholars and advocates, if you have not uh, been to the website and read the materials there, you are surely behind the times. Um, it is incredibly informative. Um, a little thing that I don't think Mark knows. Actually, I applied, I think, either for a job or a fellowship, and I was denied. <laughs> um, and so, 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 so thankfully, he didn't remember that, and he accepted my invitation to come here nonetheless. <clears throat> Uh, Mark Maurer is one of the country's leading experts on sentencing policy, race, and the criminal justice system. He has directed programs on criminal justice policy reform for 30 years and is the author of some of the most widely cited reports and publications in the field. His 1995 report on racial disparity and the criminal justice system led the New York Times to editorialize that the report, quote, should set off alarm bells from the White House to city halls and help reverse the notion that we can incarcerate our way out of fundamental social problems, unquote. His groundbreaking book, Race to Incarcerate, which details how sentencing policies led to the explosive expansion of the US prison population, was not only a semi-finalist for the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award in 1999, but a second edition was also published in 2006, and a, two, and a 2013 graphic novel version was cited by the American Library Association as one of the great graphic novels of the year. He is also the co-editor of Invisible Punishment, a 2002 collection of essays by prominent criminal justice experts on the social cost of imprisonment, and a book which I often regularly assign in my Collateral Consequences of Sentencing class. That's a plug for me. <clears throat> he has received the Helen L. The Helen L. Buttonweiser Award from the Fortune Society in 1991, the Donald Cressy Award from the National Council on Crime and Delinquency uh, for contributions to criminal justice research in 96, the Alfred R. Linsmith Award from the Drug Policy Alliance for Achievement in Drug Policy Scholarship, the Maud Booth Correctional Services Award from Volunteers of America, the John Augustus Award from the National Association of Sentencing Advocates, the Margaret Mead Award from the International Community Corrections Association, and the Inside Out Summit Award uh, from, Con uh, from Center Force. Mark is a graduate of Stony Brook University where he received his bachelor's degree and he earned his master's of social work from the University of Michigan. I know that he is indeed a tireless worker because he accepted our invitation to be the symposium keynote speaker while he was on vacation. I emailed him and they said we might be able to get in touch with him and he got back in touch with me. I'm sure much to the chagrin of his family that he was engaging in work. Uh, and so I give to you, so please help me in welcoming the 2015 Earl F. Nelson lecturer, Mr. Mark Maurer. talk to the people who handle that sort of thing in the future. Uh, it is true, uh, talking about being tireless, uh, David uh, was able to track me down the woods of New Hampshire last summer um, and, and invite me to be here. Uh, and as he mentioned earlier, um, uh, he, I won't say invited me under false pretenses, but the, the nature of the uh, discussion today uh, unfortunately changed quite a bit from the time he invited me until a couple of weeks later. Um, I do appreciate your kind words. Um, I, I've come to 
appreciate the importance of getting the introductions right and cor correct. Uh, David mentioned my book, Race to Incarcerate, and when the book was first published, I was giving a talk at one of the bookstores in Washington, and a newsletter went out promoting the talk and said, Mark Maurer <coughs> will speak about his new book, Race to Incinerate. Uh, <coughs> so those issues are important as well, but um, we're going to talk about prisons today, if that's OK with you. Um, so we're, uh, just a, a word of uh, sort of overview about our subject of, of the day's discussions here, which is obviously critically important and, and no more important place to talk about it than uh, this institution, this state. Um, it's, it's regardless of how one may view these issues, uh, it is, seems to me, it's deeply troubling in the 21st century we are still trying to understand why so many <clears throat> black men are being killed by law enforcement officers around the country. That is a, a very unfortunate situation. Uh, but, <clears throat> but the time has come to try to figure that out. So before I begin, uh, I want to tell you a quick story uh, about a friend of mine. Uh, my friend and his wife, uh, the parents of three teenage kids, two girls and a boy, their teenage son, uh, started doing things that teenage boys do. Uh, he was uh, not doing very well in school, kind of acting out, not paying attention. Uh, he was smashing up the family car now and then. There may have been some drinking or drug use going on, staying out late at night. Nothing terrible, but uh, his parents were concerned about his behavior. And then one night they get a call from the police. Their son has just been picked up for shoplifting from a local convenience store. Could they come down to the police station and pick him up? <clears throat> so they go down that night, and over the course of the next two weeks, uh, they engage in discussions with the police and then the prosecutor assigned to the case. Uh, and essentially what they did, what they said was, you know, our son has been going through a difficult period. He's having some problems. He knows it. We know it. Uh, we've actually found a social worker who we think can help him through this period. He's amenable to meeting with the social worker. We think he can deal with his issues. And the prosecutor basically said, well, you know, this is not a very serious charge. It sounds like you've got a good plan. It sounds like you have a good family structure here. Uh, <clears throat> so we can drop the charges and, you know, you deal with this as a family with the social worker and all that. So he goes off and he does meet with the social worker and she turns out to be very helpful in him figuring out where he's at, what he wants to do with his life, or at least for a while. Uh, things start to improve in his grades. He's gonna go off to college and presumably have you know, good opportunities in life to do whatever he chooses to do. Uh, I would imagine on the same night that my friend's son was arrested, not very far away, there was another young man arrested for the same crime. Uh, and this young man uh, may not have had family that had either the financial resources or the negotiating skills to deal with the police and the prosecutor and, and the justice system. Uh, now, he's not going to go to prison on a shoplifting charge, but this other young man uh, may have to do some community service work or pay some kind of fine for his offense because he doesn't have a social worker to go to. Uh, but six or 12 months later, uh, maybe he gets picked up on a larceny charge or breaking into a car or something like that. And all of a sudden, he starts to look like one of these habitual offenders, as we call them uh, in the law or so. And he starts to go down a very different path than my friend's son did. So just to say that when we're talking about issues of race in the justice system, I think we're talking about race and class and how they combine. We're talking about the resources that people bring to the system, how we resolve problems, and the formal structure of the justice system, I think, only tells us so much about where we're going and what kinds of, uh, what kinds of problem resolutions we engage in as a community. So I hope we can keep that in mind. So I want to ask sort of four questions to try to go over this morning uh, and help us think about these issues of race and justice. Uh, first is, uh, what is it about Ferguson? Is Ferguson unique in America uh, today in terms of what it tells us? Second question is, uh, to what extent are we talking about law enforcement issues or is this a broader criminal justice? Uh, concern that we're looking at. 
then what are the policies and practices within the justice system that have contributed or shaped the outcomes that we're seeing here? Uh, and finally, what can we do about it? What are the uh, prospects for reform? What do we know about what needs to be done? Where do we move on to from here? So to start, is Ferguson unique? Well, certainly as an outsider, one who doesn't, <clears throat> has never been there, doesn't appreciate it, uh, what it looks like, uh, it certainly seems like you know, uh, every bad thing you could think of has come together in Ferguson to help to create the conditions of, of what took place there. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, you know, an almost all-white police force in a majority African-American community. We have an African-American community there with very little political representation locally. Uh, we have uh, this whole very sordid system of traffic stops and fines and warrants as a means of uh, financing local government there. Uh, and then on top of that, we have all this surplus military hardware, courtesy of the federal government, uh, given away to local police forces. Uh, so while it may be the case that many jurisdictions or most uh, do not have <clears throat> such a confluence of factors that have come together, uh, it's also the case that every single one of these uh, factors and dynamics, and often more, uh, we can see all around the country. Uh, just a couple of examples of what this looks like in terms of the uh, military hardware first. Here's the heading, LA schools, Los Angeles, police will return grenade launchers but keep rifles and armored vehicles. Now you probably think I got this from The Onion or so, but this is from the Los Angeles Times, this is real. So the schools police are returning the grenade launchers. Uh, my wife happens to be a public school teacher and I asked her uh, if there was a lot of research evidence about grenade launchers and uh, improving school discipline or things like that. She was not aware of anything along those lines. Uh, you can read this whole piece, uh, it doesn't really indicate why and how they got the grenade launchers in the first place or how prevalent this is as a policy or practice or you know they just had a surplus number of grenade launchers but uh, it, it's rather bizarre to say the least. Uh, we see the intersection of money and criminal justice and how that plays out as well. Among many examples we could give on that is the whole issue of private prisons. Here's uh, an executive from one of the private prison companies. Ideally, we would prefer more federal inmates than local. Having said that, a bed with a body in it is worth more than an empty bed. Now, why would he prefer federal inmates? Well, they've got a private prison there and they contract with a variety of agencies, but they can charge the federal government more for its prisoners. I don't know if they're higher quality or they eat less food or something <laughs> like that, but uh, they get more money from them. But a bed with a body in it. That's what we're talking about uh, in terms of what our justice system is doing, uh, what this intersection looks like. So, so we could debate whether Ferguson is unique or how extreme it is, but the, all the elements we see, there's absolutely nothing that's unique as we look around the country, as we look at our justice system, how, how things are structured. So is this a question of law enforcement or is this <clears throat> the criminal justice system, broadly speaking. And it seems to me, uh, if we look over the history of our nation over the last half century or so, uh, what we're talking about is really a system, uh, a problem of race and the criminal justice system very broadly. Uh, you know, if we go back to 1954, uh, the day of the Brown versus Board of Education decision, uh, on that historic day, there were about 100,000 African Americans behind bars in our prisons and jails, 100,000. Uh, since that time, we've had opening up of social and economic opportunity for many Americans who had been denied that for a long period of time. Within the criminal justice system, we have a much greater diversity of leadership in most parts of the country. Uh, we have a long way to go as a nation, but we've had undeniable progress in many areas as a result of the civil rights movement. And yet today, if we look at our system of incarceration, that figure of 100,000 African Americans behind bars is now 800,000. So we have a real problem here and a real, 
dilemma, something to think about. How could it be that uh, we have made great strides as a nation, and yet when it comes to incarceration uh, and the issues of race and justice, uh, the situation is much, much worse than it was before the beginnings of the modern day civil rights movement. Uh, just to look at what that looks like, many of you are familiar with this story. Uh, this is the sort of growth of the prison system in the United States. If we start from 1925 and we have good data, we can see for about a period of about 50 years, we have a relatively stable prison population, state and federal prisoners. Uh, the numbers go up a little bit during the Depression years in the 30s. They go down a little bit during World War II, but no dramatic shift. And we end 1972 with about 200,000 people uh, in our prison system. Following that, Here's what's happened, what's come to be called mass incarceration over the last four decades, where we've added more than a million people uh, to our prison system. If you add in local jails, we've got 2.2 million Americans behind bars now. Uh, to put some perspective on that, the United States has become the world leader in its rate of incarceration. We currently incarcerate about 700 people per 100,000 as it's measured. This is about five or eight times the rate of comparable industrialized nations around the world. Uh, the reasons for this are very complicated, but uh, as a big picture, uh, statement to think about, uh, again, regardless of how you may perceive this has come about, what your speculation, what your ideas about mass incarceration may be, it seems to me there's something fundamentally wrong, fundamentally disturbing, uh, that the world's wealthiest society, a society that prides itself on its democratic traditions, also incarcerates a far greater proportion of its citizens than any other democratic nation does or would even uh, speculate about doing. Um, we know as well, uh, of course, that uh, incarceration doesn't cut across the population evenly by any means. Uh, data from the Justice Department shows that for uh, males born in 2001, a black male had a one in three chance of doing time in prison in his lifetime, a Hispanic male one in six, and a white male one in 17. The figures for women are lower overall, but the racial ethnic disparities are very prevalent there as well. <clears throat> so we've come to a point where one of every three black boys born today can expect to go to prison. We're not talking about a night in a county jail, but doing at least a year in a state or federal prison if current trends continue. So that's uh, obviously a very ominous sign about you know, what we've created over these past several decades. So where have these figures come from? How did we get to a point of this one in three figure. What does that tell us about uh, our society, our justice system, the like? Well, if you were to stop people on the street who are not very informed about criminal justice data and you say, why are there so many black males in prison, increasing numbers of Latino males in prison, uh, I think many people would say, well, they must be more involved in crime because the more involved you are in crime, the more likely you are to go to prison. Essentially, you do the crime, you do the time, and you may or may not like that, but that would be a sort of natural outcome, many people would say. <clears throat> so what do we know about the contribution of involvement in crime to these issues. Well, if we look at uh, who's engaged in crime, sort of arrest rates are about as close as we can come for the most part to that. Uh, African Americans now are, represent about 29% of the people who are arrested for a property crime, about 39% of the people arrested for a violent crime. And this is clearly higher than their roughly 13% of the American population. So we see a significant disparity there. What might appear at first to be a racial effect is actually you don't have to dig very deep to see this is very much one of social class, essentially poverty, concentrated poverty, and the disadvantages that come along with that that explains the bulk of what we're seeing here. Uh, and I think it's important to note that 
when we talk about issues of poverty, black poverty in the United States is generally very different from poverty experienced by other racial groups. We don't see nearly the same kinds of concentrations of poverty, and again, the disadvantages go along with that when we're looking at other groups. So white, poor people uh, are much less likely to live surrounded by other white, poor people. Yes, there's other white, poor people there, but they're not that far away from white working class people, white middle class people, and others. So it's a very different kind of experience. Uh, if we look at <coughs> involvement in crime, uh, we have self-report studies. Uh, essentially looking at uh, teenage behavior, starting off there, uh, comparing black and white youth reporting on their behaviors that could be considered criminal in various ways. And generally what we see is that there are differences in the self-reports between black and white teenage male, but the differences are not all that dramatic. What we do see is what the trajectory then looks like. Uh, for white youth, they follow what is sort of the general national pattern. That is, there's sort of a pretty steep rise in the numbers and kinds of behaviors teenage boys and somewhat girls are engaged in in the late teenage years. By the early 20s, those rates start to come down pretty sharply. Now, why do they come down after this pretty sharp rise? For the most part, they grow up, they become adults, they take on adult roles. So they go off to college, they get married, they have jobs, they have families, they have responsibilities, and those positive aspects of being an adult uh, are rewarding, they're time consuming, and they come to be valued more than hanging out with your buddies on the street and maybe getting into trouble. The distinction we see, the racial distinction then, is for black youth, the decline in those rates takes much longer. It's not till the late 20s or so that the rates start to come down significantly. Uh, and what we can see here is a question of opportunity, access to opportunity, perceptions of opportunity, and the like. When the ability to take on those adult roles, to do it successfully, to have economic support and opportunity, is not as prevalent as it is in other communities, then the trade off between the positive and the negative behaviors becomes more complicated. It's less easy to see what the advantages are <clears throat> of trying to be an adult. So we see some very distinct differences there. So we know something about crime rates as a sort of first step. We know something about the overlap between race and class effects. Um, but I think if we look inside the criminal justice system, uh, yes, the Jim Crow era is gone, and yes, uh, you, whereas it once was not uncommon to hear uh, people in the courtroom, officials in the courtroom, particularly in the South, but not only in the South, make openly racist remarks. Fortunately, uh, most of that is in the past now. But despite that, uh, the racial dynamics of justice system are still very much with us today, uh, sometimes in more subtle ways, but nonetheless uh, very significant outcomes. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is several different uh, several different factors coming together to produce this. First, race-neutral policies that are on the surface, no obvious racial effect, that have actually very disparate racial outcomes. Secondly, implicit bias among criminal justice practitioners and their decision-making day-to-day. And thirdly, resource allocations that disadvantage low-income people and disproportionately people of color. So I want to take us through parts of the criminal justice system. We've been talking about policing so far. I want to look more so at sentencing and incarceration, how we get there, and how these various kinds of factors may influence the outcomes we see, may influence uh, who we see in the prison system, this figure of 800,000 African Americans behind bars. So if we look at sentencing, um, the death penalty is the, uh, the area that we know the most about, where the evidence is, I think, uh, most conclusive and, and has been so for the last 30 years or so. And essentially, 
uh, if we want to try to figure out what are the odds that a given defendant who may be facing uh, a death sentence, what are the odds that person will get a death sentence, there are essentially two factors that seem to be very critical. One is race and the other is the quality of your defense attorney. The race factor, um, the, the race factor goes back to the 80s. Initially, a series of studies by David Baldus went to the Supreme Court. Many of you are familiar with this history, but essentially, the race of the victim is the key decided, not deciding factor, like a key factor in determining who receives a death sentence. And if you uh, kill a white person. In many of the studies, we find that <clears throat> you're roughly four times as likely to receive a death sentence as if you kill a black person, controlling for all sorts of relevant variables. Uh, bad lawyering is the, the other problem as well. Uh, if your lawyer comes to court drunk, if your lawyer sleeps through part of the trial, uh, all of which has happened in death cases, not surprisingly, you're more likely to end up on death row. Uh, <clears throat> you may be familiar with the case of the lawyer in Texas who literally slept through part of the trial. Uh, then uh, on appeal, where the uh, <clears throat> defendant essentially was saying he had ineffective assistance of counsel, and uh, he was turned down in that argument. And essentially, the decision uh, basically said, well, the part of the trial he slept through was not all that important. <laughs> um, uh, imagine ourselves for the moment uh, on trial for our lives and wondering whether any given minute is important or not uh, in the courtroom. So we know something about the death penalty. When it comes to non-capital cases, uh, the overwhelming research tells us that race is still a factor. It doesn't mean it's a factor in every single case, uh, but in the aggregate, we find that race still plays a role, often in combination with other factors. It may be race and gender, race and employment issues and the like, but in a variety of ways. So the question is, how does this come out? Why does uh, race come into our sentencing decisions? And again, just to be clear, uh, it doesn't mean that every black defendant is always going to get more prison time than every white defendant for comparable crimes or more likely to go to prison. But in the aggregate, we see the race effects. Well, we might imagine that we have you know, a bunch of racist judges around the country, and they're just more inclined to sentence black people to prison than whites for comparable crimes. And that may indeed be the case in some situations. Uh, it's also the case, though, that you know, when we look at how sentencing plays out, we tend to think of we've got two defendants in the courtroom just been convicted. One is black, one is white. Uh, so what do their sentences look like? And that's perfectly fine. And we have no shortage of studies looking at that. But that also doesn't tell us what are the odds that those two defendants ended up in court that day facing those charges. A whole set of decisions has been made prior to that day of sentencing, starting with law enforcement, most significantly through the prosecutor's office, that tell us a lot about who's ending up in courtroom. Uh, most recently in the uh, federal system, we've had some very strong research in recent years looking at the impact of mandatory sentencing and how that plays out. Uh, the research seems to suggest that decisions made by the prosecutors are very influential in determining who's subject to a mandatory penalty. Looking at uh, case characteristics that would suggest a person could be subject to a mandatory sentence, prosecutors are more likely to allow white defendants to plead to a charge that doesn't involve mandatories than they are African American defendants. Um, we see also, I think, this intersection of race and class in the courtroom, too. And imagine you're the sentencing judge. Uh, you've got two defendants in your courtroom. One is black, one is white. One has uh, got a family with some resources, the other not. They've both been convicted of a burglary charge. Uh, in both cases, there's reason to believe substance abuse was a contributing factor. Uh, so you, as a sentencing judge, 
need to make a determination about whether this person should be sentenced to prison or can be kept in the community under some type of supervision. And these are cases that come up every day, and many of these are very close calls and not easy things to consider when it's prison or no prison and something like this. Well, the family of one of these <coughs> uh, burglary defendants comes for the court and essentially through the attorney says, uh, yes, it's, it's been an alcohol and drug problem. We've got, uh, we're willing to get our loved one into a treatment program uh, to deal with it, just as I talked about my friend's family, what they did for, for their son. Uh, the other offender uh, doesn't have a family who has those resources either, so the judge if you want to think about public safety issues, risk to the community, uh, if we keep this person in the community who's not going to be any kind of treatment program, has a history of substance abuse, a history of burglary, uh, what is that saying about public safety? How do we guarantee that? Whereas if we put the, offender, <clears throat> the other offender into a treatment program, we would like to think that that can help to control those risks. So it doesn't mean the judge is racist and how the decision come about, the overlap, race and class, you know, how does that play out in determinations? We see as well, I think, sort of the implicit bias uh, that all of us uh, growing up in the society, uh, you know, uh, have to acknowledge we have to some degree and, um, you know, we need to recognize it and, and try to confront it. Um, and some very interesting research uh, looking at issues around the Boston Marathon bombing case. Uh, what the researchers did, <coughs> um, Shortly uh, after the bombing and the two brothers uh, had been identified, and now we have the trial of Johar Tsarnaev coming up, um, the researchers surveyed 400 white people and they asked the question, you know, are these brothers white? Was the question. They want to get public perception on that. Well, you know, the brothers are from the Caucasus region, so there's nobody more Caucasian than they are. Um, <laughs> but how we perceive race is very complicated, right? So on a scale of zero to 100, where 100 was white and zero was not white, they got an average response of something like 64 in terms of how people perceive their whiteness of the, of the defendant. And then they asked a series of questions about punishment, assuming that there is a conviction in the case, and essentially find a clear connection the, to the degree that people perceive Mr. Tsarnaev as not white, they come out with more punitive responses in terms of what we should do with him, clearly in terms of using the death penalty or suffering in prison, as opposed to uh, ones who perceive him as white. Yes, they want him to be locked up, generally for the rest of his life, but maybe he can be in some programming in prisons, or maybe we can learn what made him do these kinds of terrible things and the like. So, how we perceive the individual, how does that play out? Uh, this also follows you know, a series uh, of research studies uh, <clears throat> that basically suggest to the degree that white Americans in particular perceive a certain crime to be a so-called black crime. In other words, it's largely African Americans who commit whatever type of crime it is in their minds, then their support for punishment of those offenses increases as well. So how we view the problem uh, may determine what we want to do about the problem. And I think it's fair to say this is not just <clears throat> all of us as individuals, but you know, policymakers, practitioners, and the like. There's no reason to believe that they don't share the same kind of implicit biases that, that all of us do. Um, we can see what practitioners how they approach some of these issues. Um, some very interesting research a while ago in a Northwest state looking at the juvenile justice system. And the researchers were looking at the pre-sentence report that the probation officer filed with the court, uh, essentially trying to make recommendations or give background to the judge about how to uh, adjudicate the case uh, with these juveniles. And what the researchers did was they analyzed the narrative section of the, of the report by the probation officer. So essentially, the probation officer's description of 
who were these young people? What were their characteristics, their behaviors, their amenability, treatment, and the like? And what they found was that the white kids tended to be described as having environmental factors. So essentially, they were having problems at home. They weren't getting along with their family. They weren't doing well at school. They were acting out. <clears throat> they were just you know, not in control of themselves and all kinds of problems coming up. The African-American juveniles were much more likely to be defined uh, as having an antisocial personality. Now, what's the difference? What are the implications here? Well, if you have environmental problems, there are things we could try to do to deal with that. You know, we could have a counselor work with you and your family. We could have tutors in school. We could do some kind of behavioral programming in the school, in the community, and the like. There are things that we know could work and have worked for many of these kinds of problems. On the other hand, if we have a kid with an antisocial personality, we can't really provide him with a better personality, right? This is something that's too deep-seated, and we don't know how to deal with that. So again, for sort of public safety reasons, if you have reason to believe as a judge, we've got a kid with an antisocial personality, we don't know how to deal with that, then putting that person behind bars out of the community comes to seem the right thing to do. So how do these biases, how do we describe people, what information do we hear, and how do we act on it? Uh, <clears throat> you know, what are practitioners doing uh, in the system every day? We see as well, you know, we, we can look at the courtroom dynamics, we can look at the practitioner dynamics. Uh, there's also, of course, the big picture in terms of what our criminal justice policies, particularly our sentencing policies, have produced. Um, you know, as you may know, we look at mass incarceration and the particular driving forces. Uh, research from the National Research Council in a major report just last year looked at the period from 1980 to 2010, the 30-year period. That was sort of the bulk of the population increase we saw under mass incarceration, essentially asked the question, uh, how much of this was due to crime rates, changes or increase in crime rates, and how much of this was due to changes in sentencing policy? And some very distinguished criminologists came to the conclusion that this was all about sentencing policy and practice. Basically, decisions made to increase the likelihood of imprisonment if you're convicted of an offense, and also decisions made to increase the amount of time you would spend in prison. So these are very direct policy choices that we as a society have made uh, to produce mass incarceration. Now within that, um, a very significant portion of that shift has been what's come to be called the war on drugs. Uh, and the war on drugs has been significant for two reasons in particular, I think. First, for a period of about 15 years, from 1985 to 2000 in particular, it was probably the single most significant force that was driving the prison population. And secondly, particularly during that time, it was the most significant factor that was contributing to racial disparities in the justice system. Now, the big picture on that, um, if you, looking at the trajectory of the drug war, if we go back to 1980, uh, we had about 40,000 people in prison or jail, either serving time or awaiting trial for a drug offense, 40,000. Today, that figure is 500,000 behind bars for a drug offense. So to put some perspective on that, there are more people currently incarcerated for a drug offense than the entire prison and jail population back in 1980. Um, if we look at who that population is, uh, about 60% of those people are African American or Latina. So one question is, why do we see such racial disparities uh, in, in who's, who that population is from the drug war? And uh, there's <clears throat> uh, lots of research that shows that 
uh, at least drug use, uh, does not vary substantially by race or ethnicity. Uh, we have less information on drug selling, but nowhere does it suggest it would be nearly as disparate as, as the prison figures tell us. So how does the racial disparity come through, come about through the drug war in particular? Well, first, I think, uh, you know, unlike crimes like murder, rape, robbery, where there's going to be a very vigorous law enforcement response, regardless of the community, because every community and every police force takes those crimes seriously, when it comes to drug law enforcement, uh, these the law enforcement practices and policies are much more discretionary. Uh, you can have two neighboring cities. In city A, uh, the mayor and the police chief say, we're gonna go after the high level dealers and distributors who are bringing drugs into our community. We think if we can stop the flow of drugs, that's where we'll have an impact. The next city over, the mayor and the police chief say, we're going to have a zero tolerance policy. We're going to go after the big guys bringing the drugs. We're going to go after the kids on the street corner. We're going to send a message that no means no. That's what we want to do. Now, we could debate which is more effective if either of these is effective, but drug arrests are very discretionary. And in these two cities, we're going to see very different outcomes depending on how that plays out. So where law enforcement patrols, where they decide to make drug arrests and the like has an awful lot to do with the racial, ethnic outcomes that we see in court and then in prison. Uh, and I think it's important to recall this is not a new problem of the 1980s drug war. We've seen this in one form or another for 100 years. Uh, if you look at the history of marijuana policy, uh, if we go back to the 1930s, that was the time when marijuana was sort of perceived as this demon drug. And the popular image, at least, was that it was a drug <clears throat> used in the black nightclubs in the racy parts of town. It was used by Mexican Americans in their uh, nightclubs as well. Whether or not this was correct, that was a very popular image of who was using and selling marijuana. <clears throat> 30 years later, along come the 1960s, and all of a sudden, millions of white middle class college students and others start consuming marijuana in great quantities. And almost overnight, popular attitudes start to shift around marijuana. Marijuana becomes celebrated in popular culture. There are calls for decriminalization or legalization. Marijuana, people walk around with marijuana t-shirts and things like that. Well, what had changed? Well, there was absolutely nothing that had changed about the drug itself. The only thing that had changed was the perception of the user, of the consumer of marijuana, and all of a sudden it became a fun thing to do and a fun drug to be around for many people rather than the demon <coughs> drug of the 1930s. Um, we see it, you know, how these dynamics play out. You know, most recently, the most well-known example, obviously, with the Federal penalties for crack cocaine offenses, the mandatory minimums adopted by Congress in the 1980s, which punished crack cocaine offenses far more harshly than powder cocaine offenses in the mandatory sentencing structure, uh, even though crack cocaine is essentially pharmacologically the same drug and just made from powder cocaine. Uh, <clears throat> turned out, not surprisingly, that 80% of the defendants charged with a crack cocaine offense were African American, which is sort of a function of law enforcement priorities and then subject to the mandatory sentencing penalties. Uh, but it's not, uh, while the crack cocaine has been the most high profile issue, and, and I should say in 2010, uh, the sentencing disparity was somewhat amended by Congress, finally. Uh, a variety of other policies in the drug war contributed and had these kinds of outcome as well. Uh, one in particular are what are called the school zone drug laws. Uh, essentially, every state has some type of policy that uh, has the you know, reasonable goal of not wanting drug dealers to sell drugs to their kids when they're on the playground at school, essentially. So we have enhanced penalties uh, for crimes committed near, drug crimes committed near a school zone. 
The problem with these penalties and the structures is that in far too many cases, uh, <clears throat> where and how you define a school zone uh, has been completely out of control. So the question is, what is the radius around the school that determines where the zone is? Uh, there's one state where the zone at one point extended for three miles around the school. So you could have somebody at 2.9 miles from a school and supposed to know where the school is when he or she is doing a drug transaction. Um, so it enhances penalties. So why is this a policy with a racial effect? Well, if we think about uh, population density issues and the like, uh, if you live in an urban area with very densely populated neighborhoods, uh, if you look at a zone that's, let's say, 500 feet from a school, it's quite likely that much of an urban area is going to be within a designated school zone. You have this radius, you have lots of schools, lots of people living together. Uh, as opposed to a rural or suburban community, which much more spread out, less dense, and the like. So the same crime, the same drug transaction committed in an urban area is much more likely to be punished more harshly than it would be in a rural or suburban areas. People of color are more likely to live in densely populated urban areas and therefore more likely to be subject to these enhanced penalties. Now, there was nothing in the statute, nothing in the records, uh, the legislative record of these states where legislators came together and said, you know, how can we lock up more young black and Latino people for selling drugs? Let's do it through school zone drug laws but neither did anybody stop to think about what the likely impact might be about these policies. We know very well what the impact is. Uh, in New Jersey in recent years, research showed that people affected by the school zone drug laws, 96% were African American or Latino. Uh, to their credit, the New Jersey legislature reformed the law following that kind of documentation. So we have the development of mass incarceration. We have <clears throat> racially disparate outcomes at each stage of the system as it goes along. Uh, but there still may be many people, and there are people, uh, who would say, yes, we have a record number of people in prison, uh, but look at the crime rate. The crime rate has come down. Uh, we feel much safer now. This has helped uh, people in all kinds of communities. So it's too bad we have two million people behind bars, but it seems like it was a necessary policy, uh, and this is just the way it is. So what do we know about the impact of mass incarceration on our society? Well, if we look at the public safety impact, um, <clears throat> perhaps surprisingly, it's much more limited than many people believe, and it's also one that's very much subject to diminishing returns. Uh, some of the better studies looking at the impact have suggested looking at the 1990s, maybe increased incarceration were responsible for 10% or at most 25% of the impact. Uh, the National Research Council report I mentioned, uh, their conclusion was that we can't describe precisely what the impact, but it looks like it was generally quite modest. Now, in some ways, this is very counterintuitive because whether or not you're a fan of mass incarceration and think it's necessary to have two million people behind bars, one might imagine that just removing two million convicted offenders or pretrial in some cases uh, from the streets should have had a very substantial impact on crime. We're not just talking about a modest change in the population. We're talking about something that's historically unprecedented. It's as if it's a grand social experiment in controlling crime. Um, so why is the impact less so than it might, uh, we might expect? Well, I think there are a number of reasons for this, but let me just suggest one, uh, which has to do with uh, who we decide to put uh, in these prison cells. Uh, think of two offenders. Offender A is a serial rapist who's terrorizing a neighborhood. The police finally apprehend him. He's convicted in court, sent off to prison. So in this case, we put one person in prison, but we brought some real safety to the community, especially to that particular neighborhood he came from. 
Offender B is a kid on the street corner who's selling drugs. The police come by on Saturday night, they do a drug sweep, they catch him in the act of selling drugs, and they haul him off to court. He's convicted of court of being a drug seller, and he goes off to prison, let's say, on one of these mandatory drug sentences of five years. He's going to spend in prison for selling drugs. So in this case, just as with a serial rapist, we've increased the prison population by one person. Uh, what have we done in terms of public safety with this kid who's selling drugs on the street corner? Well, if you think about it, <clears throat> let's go back to that street corner where he was selling drugs. Uh, how long do you think it's going to take for somebody else to step up to that street corner and essentially take his place as a drug seller? I think in most neighborhoods it's going to take about 20 minutes after he's arrested before that happens. As long as we have a demand for drugs, uh, there's a seemingly endless supply of people, and we know this from the prison population, an endless supply of people who are trying to make a few dollars by selling drugs. Uh, and a few dollars is what it is for most of them. Most of them are not getting rich, but yet this is their form of economic opportunity as they see it. So in this case also, we've increased the prison population by one person. It's not at all clear we've improved public safety. It's not at all clear we've reduced drug consumption by keeping that person behind bars. But we have done something else also in the process. Uh, prison, conservatively speaking, costs about $25,000 a year to keep a person locked up. So when we decide to lock up this drug seller for five years, we've just made a tax dollar investment of about $125,000 to keep him behind bars. Now, suppose again we go back to that street corner, back to that neighborhood. Suppose we have a meeting of the people in the neighborhood and we say, you know, you've got a drug problem in this community. We're going to give you $125,000 to deal with that problem. You decide how you want to spend that money. Well, what might they come up with? Well, it seems to me some people would probably say, let's have a cop standing on the corner 24-7 to deter people from selling drugs. Some people are going to say we need more treatment programs. Some people say we need summer jobs for our kids. I think we could have a pretty vigorous discussion about how to address this problem. It's hard to imagine any neighbor in the country that would conclude if we just lock up one person for selling drugs and spend all our money on that, that will be the best use of our money, the best way to take care of the problem. So no one would ever, I don't think, any community would ever come up with this, and yet this is what we do day after day after day, spending money through the drug war, spending money by putting lesser offenders behind bars and the like. And it becomes a very <clears throat> vicious cycle. Um, so what else do we know about mass incarceration? Well, yes, prison does have some effect on crime. Merely by incapacitating certain offenders, clearly it makes uh, some of our communities safer. Uh, in big picture terms, though, I think that's a useful question to ask, but it's not the only question, because even to the extent that we may believe mass incarceration has had some impact on crime. It seems to me the real question is, if we want to achieve public safety, what is the best way to do that? To what extent should we spend money on prisons? To what extent should we spend on preschool programs or in drug treatment or a million other things we might do? So essentially, if we have a million dollars to spend, how do we produce public safety? And we look at it that way, <clears throat> there's no shortage of studies that show a variety of interventions, social interventions, can produce better results than incarceration will produce in the aggregate. It doesn't mean we don't need any prisons at all, but in terms of how we allocate our resources, we're very much out of balance over these years. So we know something about public safety. Um, we also know Mass incarceration's ripple effects go well beyond the individual offender in the individual prison cell. Uh, there are nearly two million children, as we speak, who have a parent behind bars. These are children growing up with a sort of loss of financial, psychological support of a parent, with the shame and stigma that comes along with having a parent behind bars. Uh, we can just imagine what uh, that may do to their 
uh, their hopes for the future, their vision of themselves, how they cope. We know a lot about the collateral effects of having just a felony conviction, let alone a prison sentence, in terms of access to employment, housing, welfare benefits, the right to vote, and the like. Uh, so increasingly, the ripple effects are getting uh, very profound. So where do we go from here? Uh, if we want to address the racial disparities in particular as we're trying to uh, dismantle a system of mass incarceration, as I think we should, um, <clears throat> how do we go about trying to make those changes? Well, I think in broad terms, uh, clearly we need to talk about sentencing reform. Clearly we need to talk about a shift in the war on drugs and the direction that that's taken. Uh, but as we do that and as we work for that, I think there are many things we could be doing growing out of these various factors that could begin to make a difference in day-to-day -day outcomes as well. Uh, let me just suggest a, a few of what they may look like. For a start, I think uh, in any jurisdiction, you know, how do we look for what we might think of as hidden bias or implicit bias uh, <clears throat> in criminal justice policies and practices? Uh, so one example among many, uh, the Annie Casey Foundation, uh, some of you familiar with it, has done a great deal of work on trying to reduce juvenile detention over the last 20 years or so with some very good success. Uh, their work in Multnomah County, Oregon, essentially Portland, uh, one of the issues they were looking at was uh, <clears throat> the use of a risk assessment instrument in trying to make a determination about which juveniles uh, needed to be detained and which ones could be living in the community. And one of the questions asked uh, in order to help uh, make that determination on the instrument was, uh, does the juvenile have a quote unquote good family structure, good family structure. Uh, well, some of us are fortunate to have grown up with a good family structure. Many people are not, and uh, do we punish them for that? So they changed the question to say, does the juvenile, is there a responsible adult who can help to supervise this young person? Responsible adult might be a minister, might be a basketball coach, might be a teacher or someone else. But not to punish somebody for having the bad luck of not growing up with a good family structure. When they did that, as soon as they changed that, the number of kids of color who were detained dropped significantly afterwards. So not a very hard thing to do, but <clears throat> a hard thing to go back and look at our assumptions and how they play out. Um, we need to look at sentencing policies, parole policies, and the like. Uh, again, ones that are seemingly race neutral, and how do they play out in practice? Um, we've had a long history in the movement towards developing alternatives to incarceration, drug courts, and the like, some of which do very good work, uh, many of which uh, produce racially disparate effects as well. Much of this comes from the criteria that are established for admission participation in these various alternatives. And typically, this would involve looking at the person's current charge and looking at his or her prior record. Uh, when we introduce prior record into the equation in any sort of sensing outcomes or classifications, this will almost inevitably uh, disadvantage people of color. Uh, for a variety of reasons, people of color, the average person of color coming in the courtroom is more likely to have a criminal record than the average white person. Now, we may think this is due to racist policing, it may be due to greater involvement in crime. There's a whole range of factors that we need to look at here, but nonetheless, uh, the average African American defendant in particular is more likely to have a prior record and therefore more likely to be screened out of participation in a range of programs. Now, this doesn't mean it's always inappropriate to look at prior record and the kinds of offenses and the like, uh, but it does suggest that we should be very careful in thinking about, you know, again, hidden bias that may be very much included in any kind of classifications we do. We see how this plays out in fairly dramatic ways uh, when the sentencing uh, implications are, are pretty extreme themselves. Uh, any, most states have some kind of habitual offender law that 
enhances punishment on multiple offenses. Uh, at the extremes, places like California with its three strikes law, where the third strike uh, can lead to a sentence of 25 years to life. Uh, today, in the California prison system, about 29% of the people <clears throat> in prison are African American. If you look at the three strikes offender population, that's 46% African American. So again, a race neutral policy, there's all sorts of reasons to uh, conclude that three strikes has not been a very smart policy, but on top of all that, the racially disparate outcomes, which absolutely could have been predicted at the time the law was put into effect, but no discussion about that whatsoever. We also, it seems to me, need to talk about how we deal with this issue of resources and disadvantaging people and the like. And here, it seems to me, what we want to be talking about is how do we level the playing field. Um, I don't think that the solution to racial disparity in prison is to lock up more white people. We have no shortage of people of all races currently in prison. Uh, I think we should be more positive about that. Um, you know, at every stage of the system, resources make a difference. And pretrial release, when people are first charged with an offense, and most jurisdictions still employ money bail to some extent, at least, or almost exclusively in some cases, uh, why are we uh, making your freedom in the community dependent on your, abil your monetary abilities. Uh, New Jersey just passed very substantial bail reform legislation that'll make it reduce the power of bail bondsmen, increase the power of the courts to release people, and the projections are they may see a reduction of half of their detained pretrial population within a few years of implementation. Uh, this whole uh, representation of indigent defense and how that functions around the country, there's probably no part of the system where we see a, a more vast gulf between the best and the worst when it comes to indigent defense. Uh, if I were charged in a felony where I work in Washington, D.C., I would head straight to the public defender office and hope I could qualify for representation there because the Washington, D.C. Public Defender Service for many years had a reputation as one of the sharpest uh, the defense organizations in the country. Very high quality defense on very serious cases and the like. And that's who you want as your lawyer. Uh, if you're in rural Georgia, uh, it's quite likely that if you're indigent, the first time you may meet your attorneys on the day in court when you have to enter a plea to your charge. And uh, your representation is going to take about 20 minutes or so until they can just shuffle the papers and enter your plea. So uh, is that real justice? Justice and how do we allocate justice when it comes to um, <clears throat> those kinds of outcomes. Finally, I think we want to be proactive as well. Um, you know, there's no, it's not that difficult to look back on all these policies and try to identify what the racial impacts were. How do we encourage that conversation, though, proactively before we put these kinds of policies in place? Why didn't we have this conversation in 1986 in Congress before the crack cocaine penalties were adopted by Congress? So in that regard, uh, I've been privileged to work with uh, legislators in a number of states in recent years to try to develop legislation that calls for what we are identifying as racial impact legislation. Now, this is very similar to fiscal impact legislation, environmental impact policies, where essentially policymakers are saying, you know, we often have unintended outcomes of new policies. We should try to anticipate that before we enact the policy rather than bemoan the fact later on. So why don't we do that with sensing policies and parole policies too? If we're going to adopt something, let's have that conversation before. So in recent years, states of Iowa, Connecticut, and Oregon have all adopted this type of racial impact legislation. Essentially, when someone introduces a policy, it says we're going to increase the penalty for burglary from three years to five years or whatever. Uh, have the legislative analysts try to crunch the numbers, see who would be affected, what would happen to the prison population, how much would it cost, and what would the racial ethnic dynamics look like as well. So just part of that whole conversation of opening up that dialogue. 
Uh, let me close on somewhat of a, try to be a little positive about where things may be going and uh, what I think is sort of a, a newfound uh, some momentum for reform of our criminal justice system. I mean, we had seen this coming, I think, for some time. Uh, it really hit home for me about five years ago. Uh, I received a dinner invitation one day at work uh, to get together with a small group of people to talk about criminal justice policy, why we had too many people in prison, and what we could do to try to reduce those numbers. And the invitation came from Newt Gingrich. Uh, now, those of you who know me, uh, no, I'm not the sort of person who thinks he's going to get invited to dinner by Newt Gring Gingrich very often. Um, but I never pass up a free dinner, so I was happy to go. <laughs> <clears throat> and it turned out we had a meeting, a group of about 25 people, maybe half a dozen of us liberal types. The others, very significant figures on the political right. In addition to Gingrich, it was Grover Norquist, the anti-tax guy. It was Michael Steele at the time, was head of the Republican National Committee and other big names uh, among conservatives. And over a three-hour dinner, we had a very vigorous conversation about uh, the problems of the prison system, the distortions of how the justice system was playing out, the allocation of resources, the impact of the war on drugs. Uh, I'm not going to suggest we came to agreement on everything, but there was a surprising amount of consensus about the excessive nature of incarceration, the excessive nature of the drug war, better ways to do things with our money. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, if one is a true conservative, a true libertarian, uh, <clears throat> the drug war, the mass incarceration, this is sort of big government at its worst. It's fiscally irresponsible. There are better ways to do things. Um, we've seen this movement on the political right for a number of years now. Next month, actually, uh, Newt Gingrich is co-sponsoring a summit event in Washington that's dedicated, the theme is uh, how do we cut the prison population by 50% over the next decade or so. This is Newt Gingrich. Uh, I'll say it's not just Republicans doing this. Uh, our Attorney General Eric Holder at a very high profile speech at the American Bar Association about a year and a half ago said there are too many Americans in too many prisons for far too long. This is sort of remarkable, I think, for the Attorney General of the United States to be saying this. A lot of people had believed that already, but to get this kind of attention is quite something. Uh, we've seen sentencing reforms beginning to be considered and take place. I mentioned the crack cocaine reform, uh, such high profile cases in New York State, the Rockefeller drug laws going back to the 1970s have essentially been repealed. Uh, in California, we've seen uh, cutting back of the three strikes policy, and California just passed something called Proposition 47, which de reclassifies a number of low-level felonies to misdemeanors, so they won't have to be held in state prison, and there'll be substantial cost savings coming out of it. We have the reentry movement, which is really taking place in all 50 states, uh, in varying degrees in various ways, but a very positive way uh, to look at things. <clears throat> the challenge we have now is much of what we've come to see about mass incarceration, it's quite clear uh, it is very institutionalized in many ways. Uh, the resources go into it, the prison buildings, the sentencing policies, the economic interests. Uh, so turning this around is not going to be simple. It's not that we can tweak a few policies and practices here and there uh, and make the kinds of changes that we need. So we need to think I think much more broadly about how to approach this. Let me just close with one, one final image. Um, back in the mid-1990s, uh, there was a small group of sort of high-profile commentators who came up with this terminology, and they started talking about a group of young people they called super predators, super predators. Um, and how they described this group, this was a group, they never quite said it this way, but they clearly were talking about black boys. Uh, and they were warning us that there was this coming generation of <clears throat> black boys 
who are going to be more violent, more out of control, more uh, immoral than any generation of kids we'd ever seen. So essentially they're warning us, you know, wait till these five-year-old kids grow up. They are going to be these super predators. Uh, and they published op-ed articles in the Wall Street Journal and they testified before Congress and got a lot of attention for this. Um, well, a couple of things happen after that. Um, you know, not long after they coined this phrase super predators and got lots of attention, not long after that, crime rates started to fall. Uh, crime rates started to fall more so for juveniles than adults, and crime rates fell for black, white, and Latino kids alike. So their powers of prediction in social science were not very sharp, certainly, and unfortunately, we've been pleased about the crime decline. But suppose for a minute, we had a situation where we had a group of five-year-old boys who we had reason to believe were going to become <clears throat> high-profile, uh, high ris risks of engagement in serious crime in, let's say, 10 years from now. So we have 10 years until this crime wave starts to happen. What would we do in terms of our policy if we believe this was the case? Well, it seems to me we have two choices. The first would be we could build as many prisons as possible as quickly as possible so we have more than enough room to keep all these super predators locked up when they start committing all these crimes 10 years from now. The other way to approach it would be to say, well, the good news is we have a 10-year window of opportunity. So what kinds of interventions can we take with families, with communities, with shifting resources to try to at least reduce the scale of the problem that we think is coming. How do we head it off in 10 years actually gives us a fair amount of time to try to do that. Well, if we're talking about our children, clear which of those choices we would make. If we're talking about other people's children, far too many people are willing to take the first choice. That is not a very pleasant one. So it seems to me our broad challenge is how do we create a conversation and environment in which we treat everyone's children as if they were our children. If we can do that, I think then we can end mass incarceration. Thank you very much. Well, the, the first question, um, yes, it's about race and class, but it's also sort of some funny dynamics of the justice system. And so the issue is, you know, we as, for public policy purposes, we can look at the broad cost, but if you're in the justice system, if you send somebody to prison, then the state is running the prison system. So the state pays at $25,000 a year. If you're sensing somebody in the community under supervision or so, then it's typically going to be a county cost to take on that money. So it's a problem that goes beyond just the racial dynamics too, but it's a question of, you know, are there disincentives to keep a person locally because if you send them off to state prison you say well it's not our problem to worry about somebody else is going to pay that or so now it doesn't mean that's why judges necessarily are doing that but certainly uh, those incentives and disincentives are there um, the research on um, perception stuff it, it's it's somewhat complicated and it looks at a, a range of different kinds of, of offenses and things like that. We have uh, one of, 
the Research Sentence Project did a very comprehensive review and compilation of all this study. It's called Race and Race and Perceptions of Punishment, I believe, and it's on our website, and it, it reviews all the research over the last 20 years or so and how that plays out. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, you get it. Um, you mentioned about sort of racial impact statements for certain policies, right? And so my question would be, given that we know it's a discretionary process from the outset, and the law enforcement needs to want to decide on who to arrest, should we engage in racial impact of resource allocation of law enforcement to certain communities? Mm -hmm. Should we say fundamentally, if we're going to police in X area, that we should look at the racialized impact of that and how we should approach if we go to a place that's got that, that lower part of Ferguson, that's got the niche population, should we approach policing fundamentally differently? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, you know, it's a long history, as you know, and, and it's a complicated one. Uh, you know, for a long time in many communities of color, in some respects, the problem was both under-policing and over-policing, right? So that uh, <clears throat> many communities of color would complain legitimately that they weren't getting police attention, resources, the same as more affluent communities would. Uh, but at the same time, when they got police attention, it often took the form of stop and frisk and related kinds of you know, intimidating uh, and, and aggressive sorts of policing. So yes, we need to uh, be looking at that and having some sort of oversight about how that plays out. Uh, you know, many of you are familiar with the, the litigation in New York City around stop and frisk in which you know, the, the, the federal judge um, told the police they need to stop it basically, uh, you know, or in, in large part because of the way it was carried out. And the research supporting that uh, showed that, you know, contrary to the po police uh, argument that, you know, they were just going where the crime was, uh, it clearly was the case that, no, they were going after black and Latino kids, and whether it was in so-called high crime neighborhoods or low crime neighborhoods, that w that's what was taking place. So that's the conversation, whether we do it formally through a, a legal requirement, whether we do it through community engagement, I think that's open for discussion, but I think that's clearly um, the conversation we need to be having about that. Yeah? Uh, four states voted to legalize adult use and uh, sales of marijuana yesterday in Washington, D.C., adult use and cultivation of marijuana became <coughs> legal. Do you favor a continued movement in that direction to tax and regulate adult use of marijuana by alcohol? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm somewhat agnostic on that myself. Um, I mean, I think I have some personal inclination to think that would probably be a good idea. Um, I think it, it's an important issue for us to discuss. Uh, I get a little nervous when I hear it linked by some people, not you necessarily, uh, as thinking, well, you know, this is part of the way to end mass incarceration. Um, you know, we should debate it on the merits and whether this would have better outcomes in general. Um, you know, if we care about the prison population, there's not a lot of people in prison for marijuana offenses. The ones who are in there for marijuana are high-level sellers, basically, and they're relatively modest in number, which doesn't mean they all need to be there for as long as they are. But um, where we see the impact of marijuana arrests is in police time and court time. And then it's very substantial. You know, half of all drug arrests for marijuana is people parading in and out of the court system. They spend a few days in jail sometimes. So in terms of how we use resources, um, there's a strong argument that <clears throat> it's very inefficient, it's very inappropriate, it doesn't help very much. You know, how we go about taxing, regulating, things like that. You know, we're, we're doing some experimentation now in, in several states, and we'll know a lot more in three or five years, I think. But um, at least so far, the world hasn't fallen apart in Colorado or Washington as a result of this. So, you know, we hope that we can see some good outcomes there. Yeah. Is there a what? A gender dimension. Gender dimension. Um, in terms of perceptions? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, there, there clearly is. You know, <clears throat> the, you know, the perception is black boys, black men, and the like. Uh, now, to be fair, you know, men do commit a lot more crime than women, and particularly among serious crimes, violent crimes, 
men of all races commit more of those kinds of crimes than women of all races do. So, uh, but nonetheless, particularly when we're talking about African American men, you know, it feeds into all sorts of other racial assumptions, presumptions, identities that uh, we have as a society, uh, and you know, I think only exacerbates all those things coming together. So. It's a complicated story, but I think it's very much one that's, um, that's very prevalent in people's minds, certainly. So then if African-American men commit one crime and women commit the, black women commit the same crime, what's the possibility of the differences in sentences? Um, well, there's a lot of research looking at men and women, uh, again, of all races and what differences there are. Um, it's, uh, the research is somewhat complicated. Um, it's, uh, Rick, you may know more about this. Um, you know, it's, uh, too many of the studies haven't looked at individual variables, circumstances of the case and the like. Uh, you know, there's some people think that women tend to be punished harsher because they're not acting like proper women should, and therefore we have to send a message. There's other people in research that suggest that women <clears throat> are more likely to get a break because they're not viewed as criminal types, and so they get off a little more lenient than men would. Um, I think overall there's not a lot of strong evidence that, says that women are punished more harshly because they're acting out of their role necessarily. And I'm not aware of a lot of research that breaks it down by race. It's t the studies I've seen, typical men versus women, just in general, sensing outcomes. Um, my question relates to the prominent line of reasoning in your article. Could you speak up just a little more? So my question is regards to the policy prescriptions in this country. How they a lot of times have unintended consequences, but they um, underlying that is explicit bias. Um, Michelle Alexander makes an argument to promote the new Jim Crow, a uh, provocative statement that our sentencing guidelines in this country can be equated to the new Jim Crow in this country um, or of our contemporary times. I wonder. Do you find that argument compelling, or would you go that far in your mind briefly to explain sentencing guidelines to the new Jim Crow era? Well, you know, uh, sentencing guidelines sort of a particular technical term. So if we think about sentencing policies broadly or so, you know, it, it in part depends, depends on how we might define new Jim Crow. Um, you know, I don't see a lot of evidence that suggests that uh, is, again, looking at the crack cocaine laws in Congress, um, I don't see a lot of evidence that suggests that, you know, there was a group of a dozen members of Congress, white men, who got together and said, you know, how can we use the drug laws to incarcerate young, <clears throat> more young African American men, and the way we'll do it is through the crack cocaine laws. So I don't know that I was conscious to that extent. On the other hand, uh, I think it's undeniable that the perception of the crack cocaine offender in the mid-1980s was clearly that of a young black man or sometimes a young black woman, you know, on the cover of Time magazine and popular imagery and the like. Uh, crack and black were very much uh, linked together. So it didn't necessarily require a conscious strategy on the part of decision makers to come up with that. Uh, I think the imagery uh, tells us a lot about just how quickly those laws were adopted. What we do know is that the mandatory penalties were put in place in almost record time. There were no congressional hearings held to determine what do we know about this drug, crack cocaine, what do we know about where it comes from, how it's sold, what happens to users, what kinds of treatment options are available. The whole conversation was focused on punishment and nothing else. So in that sense, I think it's very much racially imposed, racial assumptions that very much play into the outcome, uh, even though you won't find anything in the congressional record that specifically has, you know, a racist intent going along with it. 
So the outcome is very much the same either way, but I think the way in which it works out has to do with popular imagery, has to do with history, has to do with our you know, biases, whether conscious or not conscious, and how that comes together. Well, we need to be doing more in prisons. You know, our prisons are just scandalous. Um, you know, they're, the level of programming is <clears throat> never comes close to what, uh, what is needed to deal with all the, the challenges, the deficits that people in prison uh, you know, bring with them and that, you know, many cases contributed to the crimes, you know, for which they're there. Uh, having said that, um, you know, even the best programming in prisons and follow-up outside uh, only has a relatively modest impact in terms of reducing rates of recidivism. You know, the best programs are going to reduce recidivism five or ten percentage points, which is not trivial. You know, it's a lot of people who are not returning to crime and have better lives then and the like. Um, but it does suggest to us that <clears throat> once we've made a decision to send someone to prison, uh, there's a host of negative consequences that come along with that. And so you need truly remarkable programming to try to overcome all of that. So, you know, we have different reasons why we send people to prison for punishment, for incapacitation, rehabilitation. Um, but you know, we should be using prison as a last resort, not a first. If there's no other option that would certainly protect public safety, then we think about prison. But uh, it's really, you know, working uphill uh, once we've made that first determination about sending somebody to prison, I think. Anything else? Okay. Yeah. You mentioned several times about family structure uh, as being important in terms of the prosecutorial decision-making process and other things. Uh, and we've, we've seen study after study that shows that the family structure in America is breaking down across the board, but it's been particularly devastating in the black communities. Uh, I'm wondering, a two-part question. Number one is how can we deal with that as a society, or perhaps reverse it as a society, if you have an opinion on that. And secondarily, how might that um, work into our defense strategies when we're representing a black criminal defendant? Um, talking about those disparities and uh, opportunities and family structures and things, and how can we take that into account as their defense attorney? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, those are good questions. Um, well, you know, in terms of family structure, or you know, two parent families in particular, I assume. Um, you know, one of the problems is stop incarcerating too many people. So many people. Um, you know, if you look at one of the many sort of collateral effects of mass incarceration in African American communities is a very substantial gender imbalance that gets produced. Uh, in, in my book, Invisible Punishment, one of the researchers writing there uh, did some quantitative work in Washington, D.C., uh, looking at this gender imbalance. Uh, and he found in the high incarceration neighborhoods, there were 62 adult African-American men for every 100 adult African-American women in those neighborhoods. So where are the missing men? Well, some of them have died, some of them in the military, but a lot of them are behind bars. So um, it, it does annoy me when I hear political people, you know, bemoaning, oh, it's terrible, all these kids growing up in single parent families and, you know, after they just pass some kind of mandatory sentencing bill or something too. Um, you know, we're, if you really care about this, you need to, look at the link. And I'm not suggesting incarceration is the only issue that's, you know, relating to family structure, but it's, it's having a very significant effect. Um, I'm not an attorney. Um, I, I don't know how you present these things in court. When I used to get calls uh, way back, we did some studies in the 90s where we documented sort of some of the, the rate of African-American males in criminal justice supervision, and the rates were nearly, you know, one in three for black males in their 20s under some form of criminal justice supervision. And I used to get a calls from the defense attorneys occasionally saying, I've got a sentencing hearing tomorrow. Can you give me the exact data? I want to go to the judge and say, uh, you know, did you know one in three young black men is in the control of the justice system? So I'd give them the information. I said, 
you know, let me know how it goes in court, and they never called back. So <laughs> it makes me wonder whether it was a very successful strategy. Um, I don't know. We need to figure out a way to get this into public consciousness, to bring it in the courtroom. Um, I don't think the numbers themselves in an individual case, are, that's not what's going to sway the judge. But if there are ways to <clears throat> use that to provide a context uh, in addition to whatever other arguments you have, you know, that's where uh, you know, we may begin to see some differences play out. I mean, there's some anecdotal evidence among jurors <clears throat> where, <clears throat> you know, we've, we've seen interviews afterwards and, you know, there's been a holdout juror who said, well, I didn't want to send another young black man to prison on this low-level drug charge and things like that. And, you know, I don't know what that means in terms of your strategy and how you play that out, but, um, you know, in terms of public education and how we think about these issues, um, you know, it's a big picture question, I think. All right. Anything else? I want to thank uh, Mark Marlowe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.